Welcome all. Um, as we gather in this virtual space, we acknowledge that the ground beneath our feet around the world is historically the home of indigenous peoples, many of whom have been forced out or marginalized in their own territories. In the United States today, it is June, Juneteenth, a day commemorating the end of slavery in this country. Despite various forms of emancipation, we know and acknowledge that inequity, which can be directly traced back to enslavement and colonization, persists today. The ABC Summer School is humbled and honored to have its launch on this day, to be an experiment in edging toward a more honest and inclusive architectural education. The intent of our first theme, which is simply titled Capitalism, is to offer a foundational framing of how capitalism and its partner, colonialism, set the ideologies, relationships, and mechanisms within which architecture ultimately operates. Over the next six weeks, you might sometimes wonder what any given topic or discussion has to do with architecture. This is precisely the question we want to raise. Architectural education has for far too long been designed to be complicit with the inequities produced by capitalism and deliberately siloed into an end stage service that designs beautiful memorials but does not question the war. As such, this school is an experiment in bringing the criticality of a liberal arts education to a professional discipline. So as we begin this session, this is how it is structured. Uh, the two hour session on capitalism will begin with 15 minute presentations by our four or five invited speakers who will be giving four presentations, followed by a brief moderated discussion with them. After the moderated discussion, we will go into breakout rooms designated for each home base group. You all just met your home base group of 30 uh, to identify questions for the speakers and reconvene back here for a final discussion. Peggy, would you briefly introduce our speakers? Uh, we will paste more detailed bios of all the speakers in the Zoom chat. Yeah. Um, so, uh, just to quickly introduce the speakers here, but again, the extended bios will be in the chat. Uh, Anna Maria Leone, Assistant Professor, University of Michigan, and Andrew Hersher, Professor, University of Michigan, are co-founders of Settler Colonial City Project, and they will present their position on settler colonialism as a specific form of capitalist hegemony. Raj Patel, Research Professor at the University of Texas, Austin, and a Senior Research Associate Rhodes University, South Africa, will present his position on climate injustice and its effect on global food production. Huda Tayob, senior lecturer, University of Cape Town and co-curator of race, space and architecture, will present a position on subaltern architecture and the politics of invisibility. And Matthew Sewells, associate professor, University of British Columbia, will present his position on architecture as a form of capitalist financialization. Welcome all of you speakers, and we are so honored to have you with us for the first capitalism session of our ABC School. You all have different lenses by which you interrogate capitalism, but you all have done so with a depth that allows us to connect its machinations across those different filters. We will not break between talks or reintroduce you, so each of you should step up after the prior speaker is finished. And so, Anna Maria and Andrew, take it away. Thank you so much, uh, Peggy. Thank you, Priyanka. Um, and thank you, Architecture Lobby, for the invitation to join you today. Um, I speak to you today from the territory known ancestrally as Sumpa, home of the Huancavilca peoples, whose descendants live and labor in the land and the ocean of what is present day Ecuador. And I'm speaking to you from occupied territory, just north of the contemporary city of San Francisco, known ancestrally as Olimoloque to the Miwok people, who are one of the indigenous peoples to whom this was homeland, who still inhabit this land, who sustain this land, and who are sustained by this land, even as they've been joined by and displaced many other people during two centuries of colonialism, which is, of course, a process that continues until today across the United States. 
we encourage uh, all of you, wherever you are, to learn about the processes of inhabitation and displacement that have taken place or originated from the land where you find yourselves. We also want to acknowledge that today, as Peggy mentioned, the U.S. celebrates Juneteenth National Independence Day, a day in which we celebrate the emancipation of African Americans who have been enslaved. While we welcome the recognition of this holiday, we also want to uh, acknowledge that we should not be interpreted as an ending to past and ongoing oppression and racism. We understand that ending as a aim, or, or maybe even the aim of today's discussion. What is the relationship between capitalism, which today's discussion is centered on, and colonialism, which has shaped the history of capitalism and the experience of capitalism in the United States, in the Americas, and across the globe, as our land acknowledgments, as well as the land acknowledgments offered earlier today by Palmyra and Peggy might have already suggested. What we'd like to do is offer a response to this question in our contribution to today's discussion. We see the history of capitalism and the history of colonialism as the same history. And we see the willful separation of these narratives as an ideological act. To the colonizer, the territories occupied for extraction are a given and the native populations is a, becomes an obstacle that must be either eliminated or transformed into a productive labor force. It is therefore profitable, both economically and culturally, to render capitalism and colonialism as separate. The former belongs to a narrative of upward progress and development, while the latter is linked to colonized territories and peoples, alighting the empires that profited from the extraction of land and labor. Thus, the history of the so-called great civilizations of Europe and its architectures, say the Italian Renaissance or the English picturesque garden, is taught separately from the extractive empires that funded these developments and the cultural exchanges that in many cases fueled and promoted them. In settler colonial states, such as the United States, the impulse to actively seek European cultural references and lineages is not a coincidence. It is part and parcel of the identity formation required in order to continue to negate settler colonial status, a status predicated on the occupation of indigenous land and the extraction of enforced and slave labor. Thus, the formation of a settler mentality turns colonization inwards. It depends on white supremacy for nationalist identity formation. It depends on racism for enforced labor by producing, in the words of Ruth Wilson Gilmore, the state sanction or extra legal production and exploitation of group differentiated vulnerability to premature death. And it depends on turning land into property for capital formation. Delinking architecture from capitalism means delinking it from white supremacist tropes based on false narratives. It means delinking it from its reliance on enforced, underpaid, unsafe and ultimately uncaring forms of labor. And it means delinking it from its reliance on property. So let's delink architecture from capitalism and from colonialism. How might we think about these delinkings? We might begin by considering Marxist theory and, and, and the way in which this theory, which of course, underlies the most incisive critiques of capitalism, property, and architecture, has itself been enmeshed in the colonial separation of capitalism and colonialism. And this is an enmeshment, which me has meant that as critiques of capitalism, property, and architecture have been laid out and advanced, critiques of colonialism have often been deferred or disavowed. The theoretical separation of capitalism and colonialism that we want to problematize is, is actually demonstrated quite clearly in Marx's own writings. For, for Marx, colonialism was a stage in world history. It was, it was not only a stage that had a beginning and an end, but it was a stage that was at the beginning of capitalism's modern history. And so if Marx theorized colonialism within a critique of capitalism, he also rehearsed colonialism's self-theorization as a temporary phase of development, a theorization 
that recuperated the violence of colonialism within a teleology of historical progress. And so Marx understood colonialism in the frame of what he called, famously, primitive accumulation. And this was his term for the seizure of land and resources and labor from spaces outside of capitalist control for the production of surplus value. And in his book, Capital, he described a series of processes that accomplished these seizures. He, he talked about the dispossession of indigen indigenous peoples from their land, the extraction of indigenous wealth this, in the form of resources from that land, the enclosure of indigenous commons, and the commodification of indigenous labor power through exploitive labor practices and also the expropriation of labor by slavery. Now, at some point, Marx thought all indigenous land would be colonized and primitive accumulation would end. But Marxist theory into the present has been preoccupied with primitive accumulation as an ongoing process, a process that in fact is hardly primitive at all. And, and, and Marxism has struggled to theorize this persistence, but rather than accounting for this persistence via the persistence of colonialism, a central trajectory of Marxist theory, we would argue, has resorted to economic dynamics that are supposedly imminent to capitalism and removed from the supposed primitivity of colonialism. And so, for example, in the early 20th century, Rosa Luxemburg's accumulation of capital posed primitive accumulation as a structural process within capitalism that solved what she understood to be the problem of what she called underconsumption. This was a problem connected to the inability of structurally exploited workers to adequately consume the output of capitalist economies. Hannah Arendt later expanded on Luxembourg's critique in her 1968 book, Imperialism, where she wrote, the original sin of simple robbery, which centuries ago had made possible the original accumulation of capital and had started all further accumulation, had eventually to be repeated, lest the motor of accumulation suddenly die down. And more recently, scholars have accounted for the per persistence of primitive accumulation in late or advanced capitalism via another problem, the problem of over-accumulation, which just like underconsumption, is supposedly imminent to capitalism. So take, for example, David Harvey, uh, who discusses uh, uh, a dynamic supposedly fundamental to capitalism as uh, uh, an ongoing search for opportunities for the profitable investment of accumulated capital. Harvey therefore reads primitive accumulation as a means to not only expand demand for consumption, but also, and, and for him much, much more importantly, to expand possibilities for profitable investment. And because this expansion must be undertaken constantly, primitive accumulation is, uh, as Harvey argues, a, a continuing process that he terms accumulation by dispossession. This is a term that's now widely used across the disciplines, but let's look at it a little bit more closely. Harvey describes accumulation by dispossession as taking places in spaces that are either not yet under capitalist control or separated from their owners by force. And in his words, capitalism can either make use of some pre-existing outside or it can actively manufacture it. If those assets, such as empty land or new raw material sources, do not lie to hand, then capitalism must somehow produce them. Now, the pre-existing outside is the space where colonialism unfolds. But Harvey distinguishes this space from an outside that's supposedly manufactured by capitalism itself. So here, capitalism becomes a kind of colonialism without colonialism, a capture of land, labor, and resources that possesses all the features of colonialism as such. And it's through this conceptual distinction between a manufactured para-colonial outside and the pre-existing outside where colonialism as such takes place, the critical theory of capitalism is registering its own inability to engage historical movements of colonial logics and practices. So in this sense, we, we, we read accumulation by dispossession as the latest term in the Marxist lexicon for colonial dispossession 
that disavows the persistence of colonialism. For those dispossessed by colonialism, the enmeshment of colonialism and capitalism has been vivid and apparent. So for example, in M.A. Césaire's 1950 essay, Discourse on Colonialism, colonization appears as, in, in Césaire's words, a form of civilization which, at a certain point in its history, finds itself obliged, for internal reasons, to extend to a world scale the competition of its antagonistic economies. And, and, and in, in our moment today, critical indigenous theory has built on the distinction between what's often termed exploitation colonialism, in which colonists extract labor and resources from indigenous land without permanently settling on that land, and settler colonialism, in which colonists not only exploit indigenous land, but also assume sovereignty over that land. And they, and they build on this distinction to supplement the Marxist theory of accumulation and pose the persistence of primitive accumulation as the persistence of settler colonialism. And so, for example, in his 2014 book, Red Skins, White Masks, Dene scholar of indigenous studies, Glenn Coulthard, describes settler colonialism as territorially acquisitive in perpetuity. And for Coulthard, this description opens onto a critique of the Marxist framing of indigenous dispossession as a mere way station on the historical journey to a redistributive commons, a critique of the Marxist focus on the exploitation of people as labor power over the exploitation of land as property, and, and much, much else besides. Now, Coulthard turns to an analysis of the contemporary city to register the persistence of indigenous dispossession, but we follow urban communities of the dispossessed across the globe and extend his analysis to encompass settler dispossession, not only in indigenous spaces, but also spaces inhabited by a whole range of working class and disadvantaged communities, and in particular, communities of color whose labor has become irrelevant in post-industrial capitalism. And so in, in settler colonial settings like the United States, a settler colonial framing of contemporary urbanism shows that this urbanism might be best understood not as a kind of generic accumulation by dispossession, but rather as a settler accumulation within settler colonialism, which not at all incidentally is how those experiencing this dispossession already know it. The processes of colonialism and settler colonialism in the Americas operated precisely through the layout of cities and territories, through urbanism. As a practice of seizing land from indigenous peoples, colonization depends on the transformation of land and water into border territory that can be claimed, surveyed, defined, depopulated, and resettled. In the Americas, these operations were aided by an architectural and urban planning tool, the grid. In the territories colonized by the Spanish Empire, the ordinances for the discovery, the new population, and the pacification of the Indies, enacted by Philip II in 1573, summarized an ongoing set of instructions to settle populations with a checkerboard plan, both a remarkable document of modern urbanism and a record of colonial violence. This violence included the distortion and destruction of indigenous landscapes, which also sometimes included grids. However, as a Mara artist and museum director, Elvira Espejo has explained in discussing indigenous weaving, the aesthetics of indigenous grids are the result of a process rather than a product in themselves. In contrast, the colonial grid of the law of Indies mapped and represented power. It determined the location of the representatives of local imperial and ecclesiastical rule as well as the local hierarchies from the center to the periphery. Through the grid, the colonial city implied domination and allowed enforcement. In the United States, the public land survey system enacted with the National Ordinance of 1785 and better known as the Jefferson Grid, transformed the landscape into property to be bought and sold. A foundational moment for indigenous genocide in the United States the Jefferson Grid cartographically occupied territory before its actual settlement and prepared its transformation into property. 
with the Louisiana Purchase, Jefferson started the incremental acquisition of territory from other empires at the same time as he waged war against its indigenous populations, pushing them westward. The Jefferson grid thus abstract territory and elides the violence involved in this operation. The dispossession of land through enforced treaties, the forced displacement, the violence of war. Through a formal move right out of his architectural toolbox, Jefferson mobilized the grid in order to claim possession of the land before settler occupation. The grid authorized and enabled possession. We might understand how the grid was mobilized in the Americas as a colonial geoepistemology that separated land and water, that delineated property lines, cities, regions, and states. Comparing the grid of the Law of Indies to the Jefferson grid reveals different power dynamics in terms of land tenancy. In the territories of the Spanish Empire, the Law of Indies determined urban center, centers, leaving large tracts of land that were occupied by powerful landholders. As these territories transitioned to independence, this power concentration remained. In the United States, the Jefferson grid covered all the territory in order to claim a democratic distribution of the land. These small landholders were thus held accountable for the continued occupation of the land, a settler colonial democracy dependent on occupation and possession. This form of property thinking is countered and contested as proposed by Edouard Glissant by regenerating relations among humans, across species, between nations. Bolivian indigenous scholar Silvia Rivera Cusicanqui extends this understanding to history when she speaks of a decolonization of imaginaries and of the forms of representation. Rivera Cusicanqui proposes that the indigenous world does not conceive of history as linear. The past future is contained in the present. Accordingly, decolonization is not a moment to reach but one that emerges at any point in time as indigenous peoples claim their own historicity. Following Rivera Cusicanqui then, the writing of history and also perhaps the practice of an architect of the farm can be thought of as a potentially decolonizing practice or practices that can help us regenerate our relations with each other and with the land. Thank you. Thank My you. goodness, that's very hard to follow up. Um, but uh, I'm going to try. Th thank you, uh, Anna Maria and Andrew, for uh, for, for that marvelous presentation. Um, I'm going to uh, well, first of all, let, let, let me introduce myself. My, uh, my name is Raj Patel. Uh, pronouns he him. I am on uh, the uh, an occupied land here in Texas, uh, land that was at the southern tip of the Comanche Empire, and before that was part of the uh, was uh, inhabited by, among others, the Tonkawa people. Now we go through this uh, this sort of um, uh, notion of. Uh, ideas of, of sharing our, uh, you know, the, the land that we're on in order to take a relationship to the ways in which we participate in and are colonized by longer histories of the frontiers of capitalism. Um, and so uh, I, I'm, I'm very much an imposter here because I don't understand a whole lot about architecture, but I do understand a little bit about food systems. Uh, and what I want to do is perhaps uh, lean into some of the discussions around how capitalism operates through frontiers by offering uh, a way of thinking about capitalism and a way of understanding how it is that uh, we we remain uh, its subjects and a particular colonial capitalism. And so what, what I want to do is, uh, first of all, sort of go the long way around by asking um, and I, I wonder if, can everyone see this, this, this quote here? Uh, when jobs, thank you. Okay, so, so here, here's a quote. I, I just love your thoughts on this. Um, when jobs are scarce, men should have more right to a job than women. Uh, now, I, I wonder if, if you can use uh, the wonderful tools that we have in Zoom to put your thumbs up if you agree with that. Okay. Not many thumbs happening. Uh, now, it, it, it's uh, th this was something that was part of something called the World Values Survey. And this, this question was administered to people in a range of countries. Um, and uh, this was done in what, 2016. Uh, in 2016, 2% of Swedes uh, agreed with this statement. 5.7% uh, of Americans did, 52% uh, of Indians and 996 of Egyptians. 
who uh, were asked this question. Now, before you judge, uh, and and uh, before the, the sort of feeling of smugness uh, overcomes us all, um, bear in mind that there are there could be very logical reasons for agreeing with this. Uh, if, for example, you live in a patriarchal society, and we all do, uh, but if you live in a particularly patriarchal society where uh, women's jobs are just uh, absolutely paid much, much, much less than men's jobs, and you are hungry and you need a job to put fat food on the table, uh, and there is a scarcity of jobs, then you would rationally want the high paying job, not the poor paying job. So uh, if that were the case, then uh, you, clearly poverty uh, exacerbates the, the, the extent to which uh, patriarchy reigns. Uh, so there is a way of stripping out uh, income uh, and the, the, using some complicated econometrics some uh, researchers were able to go back through 200 years of records uh, and to find uh, why it was that some places are more sexist than others. Uh, and they, they evaluated a range of things. They looked at things like you know, the presence or absence of oil, for instance. Could it be that a resource curse uh, is bending people's uh, understandings of what is acceptable in terms of gender equality? So you know, think of countries that are oil rich and then think about whether they are particularly sexist and ask, well, does the oil cause that? And there, there are reasons to think that a resource curse is generally a bad thing, um, but may maybe it's to do with religion. Uh, you know, perhaps people's faith uh, twists the ways in which uh, they they approve or disapprove of gender equality. Could it be, you know, underwear advertising, or just generally sort of representations of female bodies in the mainstream media? Um, uh, you know, could it just be that the prevalent sexism then feeds upon itself, or could it be, you know, he says, looking for something that begins with P, plows? Um, and of course, the answer is plows. Uh, in a really important, so this was uh, 2010 was when the question was mentioned, in 2013, um, the, uh, in the Quarterly Journal of Economics, which is one of the, the sort of gold standard journals uh, for, for, for the profession, uh, a range of scholars uh, asked, well, what is it that is driving uh, attitudes towards gender inequality? Uh, and uh, more than anything else, if you take out income, uh, it is whether there has been a tradition of plowing the soil in the country. So have a think about that for a second and think about how that intersects with uh, what, you know, what, what Anna Maria and Andrew were just saying about settler colonialism. Uh, that, in fact, you know, it's important to remember that the plow is in large parts of the, uh, of the world uh, a, an implement of a certain kind of agriculture that comes with colonialism. Um, now, one could explain this using some very complicated diagrams, uh, but what I want to do is uh, have a look at this instead. Um, we, so this is a 1750 painting uh, by uh, Thomas Gainsborough. It's called Mr. and Mrs. Andrews. Uh, and in it, you've got the seeds of being able to understand how colonial capitalism operates, even though this uh, particular painting uh, was done in, you know, is of, of an actual place in England called the Orberies uh, in, in Sudbury. Uh, and you can, you can go there, you can still see that, uh, that oak. Um, and by just having a good look at this picture, we can start to understand what and how capitalism operates in terms of our imaginations, in terms of the transformations of frontiers uh, in, in, in the territorial world, uh, and points us to understanding what it is we need to be looking out for when we're, we're, when we're thinking about capitalism. So let's begin with this guy. Uh, so Thomas Andrews, um, you know, when you look at him, what do you notice? What do you see about, for example, his clothing? Um, one of the things you might observe is that he is relaxed. Uh, of the clothes that he's wearing, that, I mean, his, his outer jacket has just one button done up. Uh, and that is, you know, and his posture, you know, sort of demonstrates very clearly that here's a guy who's richer than you and knows it and doesn't give a fuck. Uh, he is absolutely in charge of everything, as well he should be. I mean, look, at he's, he's got a dog looking up, uh, you know, in adoration. He's got a dead animal tucked under his arm. Uh, he's got, uh, obviously, he's got his gun. And he's got this property. He's got, he's got all of this stuff here, um, which uh, he's you know, married into. And we'll, we'll, we'll get to, to the fact also that he is a farmer. He is a man who had uh, published 
uh, articles in the agronomy journals of the day. Um, he had a, a piece on a wheat fungus, and he also had a piece called On the Profit of the Modern Farm. And what do you notice about this part of his farm? Well, you'll notice that these are nice, neat rows that were put there, possibly using uh, the seed drill, a modern technology uh, invented by Jethro Tull. You'll notice, of course, plow, the, the, the result of plowing. Um, and you'll notice these nice, neat sheaves of wheat. Uh, and uh, you won't see, though, uh, any of the workers who put this here, of course. Uh, the, the workers are invisibilized in this story. Uh, in the story of, of capitalism, uh, what has happened is that this man has bought other people's labor, applied it as a resource to the land. Uh, he's got these sources of profit here, and everyone else has been banished. And, and you can sort of see uh, that you know, this is a bleeding edge technology you know, farm using, using absolutely the sort of zenith of technology of the day. Um, and part of that technology is not just the plow, but also the relationships of domination and power that come with it. And, and in the background here, uh, you can see uh, some of the vestiges of that. This is land that was once part of a commons. And before capitalism, uh, English feudal relations uh, uh, meant that uh, the commons was an area where, under feudalism, the peasantry were able to find enough resources and govern them sufficiently well to be able to encourage, you know, to be able to help them to survive. Um, so you hear often about the tragedy of the commons, uh, and the tragedy of the commons isn't what you think. It's not that all of a sudden there were millions of peasants on this land and they denuded it. No, uh, the tragedy of the commons was that it was taken from the peasantry. Uh, this land was land in which, for example, women were able, you know, were able to dairy, were able to run cattle, and the cattle were able to graze in this area of the commons. But after the advent of capitalism, after the advent of enclosure, uh, and after the advent of cycles of debt and poverty that uh, you know, incited the bourgeoisie to uh, enclose this land, uh, peasants were driven off. And when women who were peasants couldn't run their dairies uh, and couldn't run their cattle over the land, then all of a sudden you started to see this divergence between women and men's wage rates. So if you look back, uh, the, the advent of the history of plowing is directly connected to sexism because it involves an enclosure of the land and a, uh, a, a, a confinement of the kinds of roles, for example, that women were able to do, and certainly peasant women, were no longer able to dairy. And so all of a sudden you start seeing uh, declines in relative wage rates between men and women uh, at the advent of the transition from uh, feudalism to capitalism. And that's you know, the, the sort of short answer to how it is that uh, uh, sexism is associated with the plow. It's not that the plow is some magically sexist instrument, it's that it is a technology that features in a suite of technologies that are about the domination of land, that are about the control of certain kinds of bodies, uh, and are about the generation of profit in this picture. Uh, all of that is absent but present if you can read the, if you can read the silences, if you can read the omissions in this, in this painting. Uh, and you can read it, uh, you know, for example, in the background, if you know that this is all actual land, you'll know that, that this is property that came from uh, Mrs. Andrews side of the family. Mrs. Andrews father was a banker who got rich from uh, the, uh, the colonial exploitation of silver mines in, uh, in Potosi. Um, you know, all the, 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 the silver that flowed down the Silk Road from Europe to China came from the New World, and lots of people profited from it, including uh, this particular English banker whose daughter uh, married this man, and there she is, Mrs. Andrews. Let's, let's look at her for a second. Um, you'll notice that she doesn't look like her husband. She is, uh, although she is dressed in finery, she's clearly, I mean, look, look at her shoes here. Uh, these are not shoes meant for the outdoors. She is uh, ramrod straight compared to her husband. Um, and you'll notice that in the middle of the canvas, uh, there is an unfinished part of the, the painting. Um, uh, some have suggested that uh, it was going to be where, uh, you know, uh, something from the hunt was going to be put in her lap, or uh, more reasonably, some would say that, that uh, it, it would be where, were she to give birth to a boy, that's where he would fit in. Uh, but, uh, you know, critics have, have looked at this painting and seen in it uh, a sort of emblem for capitalism, uh, of, of uh, domination and enclosure, uh, and have observed that uh, in the relationship between husband and wife under English capitalism, 
uh, there, th th that Mrs. Andrews is as dominated and as constrained as enclosed as the land that was once uh, a, a commons for the peasantry. Um, now, I, I point all this out without coming to the new world because uh, th these features of uh, the English garden, as, as we saw in Anna, uh, Anna Maria and Andrew's presentation, are certainly with us here. Uh, but they, they also happened simultaneously uh, through Europe. The, the, there were peasant wars uh, fought in order to be able to uh, you know, guard and maintain a certain kind of relationship between peasantry and land uh, and uh, you know, feudal lords, and that, those, those peasant wars were lost. Uh, but they continue to smolder uh, around the world, and we can certainly talk about sort of ongoing peasant resistance. But all of this is to say, look, if you want to understand capitalism and understand that we are colonized and we are, you know, that, 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 that capitalism operates through us and through ideas uh, around, for example, uh, patriarchy that continue, continue well um, into the present day from its origins in certain kinds of technology and uh, uh, regulation of bodies, uh, land and power. So um, let me um, uh, just uh, sort of end up. I mean, I, I've, uh, one of the things I assigned was uh, a discussion about uh, chicken nuggets. And I just very quickly want to end on that, um, just because I, I think it's important for us to understand that that you know, picture from the 1750s uh, still matters, that it's understandings of how labor and uh, women's work and uh, you know, territory all fit together are with us now. Because if there is, any civilization that comes after humans, what will they find in the record? They'll find, you know, our radioactivity from nuclear weapons tests. They'll find plastic, and there'll be more plastic in the sea than fish by 2050. And they'll find bones, bones of the world's most popular bird. Um, uh, you know, chicken, we'll find, because at the moment we go through billions of chickens. There are 12 billion chickens around now, uh, but they last for about 90 days before they are turned into nuggets. Uh, so 50 billion chickens a year is what we go through. And we need a regime in order to be able to turn these, you know, the, the, uh, a particular bird into something of which there are trillions of bones throughout the fossil record and in perpetuity on this planet. Uh, and that means an attitude to nature that allows us, for example, to, to consider that the red jungle fowl is something that we can and should manipulate and transform and genetically engineer uh, using government subsidy into something that has breasts so large that it can't walk. And in the process, we're losing obviously a great deal of biodiversity and creating uh, a massive problem in terms of social and ecological uh, uh, crises. Um, you know, let me just summarize that here. Uh, but this isn't to say, look, uh, we're in some sort of Malthusian moment. Uh, we're in a capitalist moment of crisis. It's not just that people are shagging and consuming and eating more exponentially. It's that capitalism has brought us to the precipice. Now, let, let's return to our chicken nugget very briefly. Um, to remember that, you know, in order to turn a chicken into a nugget, you need labor. You need exploited labor. In, uh, in the United States, uh, prison laborers are used. Uh, there's also a very sad example in uh, Oklahoma where chicken executives said, look, we can solve the opioid crisis and the fact that we uh, can't find workers to work on the night shift. Uh, they set up something called uh, Christian Alcoholics and Addicts in Recovery, uh, an organization that uh, basically uh, diverts people from opium-related um, jail terms into working on the chicken production line for free at night. And it, it's a sort of ironic uh, inversion of the ways that uh, you know the colonists first came to, 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 to the Western Hemisphere. And what do they do? Um, they enslaved indigenous people and made them work to death uh, in order to achieve redemption. And in the chicken industry, the same thing's happening. You're praying to Jesus by day and by night, you're working for redemption on the chicken line. Uh, but that kind of work is, you know, uh, 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 you know requires a community of care beneath it. Uh, and the, the damage done to people's bodies is you know, uh, uh, atrocious through this, this kind of exploitation. Uh, let, let me just uh, sort of skip forward and observe that one of the ways that capitalism doesn't pay its bills is not merely by not paying enough for labor and for the care of that labor, but also, uh, you know, actually cheap food is itself a capitalist object, a way that, that the working class is uh, enabled to survive through the exploitation of 
uh, a range of other you know, uh, uh, you know, things that are turned into resources. Um, getting to this sort of fifth of our seven cheap things, we, you know, the, the system needs energy. Uh, you know, the, the hen houses need uh, cheap and abundant energy to, to keep them warm. You need vast amounts of fossil fuel uh, to, you know, to, to, to sort of fuel the engines of modern capitalism. Uh, and you also need cheap money. This is a, a, a point that I think is often missed in our discussion of capitalism, is that, that capital is not money. Um, capital is about the circulation of money, and uh, you know every small uh, you know KFC in the United States uh, that's not owned by KFC itself is a franchise, a small business eligible for two million dollars in in uh, small business administration loans. Uh, these loans are the cheap money that allows the exploitation of the frontiers of capitalism, uh, subsidized in in, you know, in large part by the by the state. Uh, and of course, with uh, interest rates hitting zero now, uh, it's it's a very sort of crisis a moment of crisis. And finally, uh, I just want to observe that uh, you know th that the, the the sort of ongoing uh, sort of process of capitalism involves. Uh, a, a an understanding that some lives are and remain disposable. Uh, you know, here we are in Texas on Juneteenth, uh, celebrating not the end of slavery, but merely the announcement that it probably should end soon. Um, and we're still waiting. Uh, and the, the the idea of uh, cheap lives. Uh, you know, if you look at the chicken production line, it's always disproportionately women and people of color whose lives are disposed. But globally, we are seeing a resurgence of uh, levels of modern day slavery that are comparable to the zenith and the entirety of the transatlantic slave trade. Let me stop there, um, because uh, although you know, th th there's, there's lots more to say, I, I'm, I'm very excited to, to wrestle with y'all in terms of thinking about how we dock some of the ideas around how capitalism refuses to pay its bills uh, and the dimensions in which it refuses to pay its bills and the ways that we can perhaps uh, shunt that discussion in towards you know, thinking about how architecture is complicit, both in the creation of uh, certain norms around how space and people uh, and the, the web of life fits into space, uh, but also how, you know, how it is that we might resist. So let me stop there, but thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much uh, to the organizers for inviting me to be here today um, and, to, and to the previous speakers. Um, okay, so let me just <laughs> jump into things too. Um, so I'm going to um, talk about uh, part of my research, which is framed around the concept of black markets. Um, and this is a framework that I that I used to read the Somali mall in this case, but actually a set of markets run by migrants, refugees and asylum seekers um, in Southern Africa more generally as, an infrastructure, as infrastructural sites of transnational migration, refuge and care. So I'm going to talk today about three specific and located sites of field work, um, namely Garissa Lodge in, oh, hang on. Sorry, uh, I think my screen is. Oops. Just going to share again. Okay, hopefully you can see the screen this time. Um, okay, so I. Uh, so I'm talking, I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to talk about three specific and located sites um, that I've been working with, uh, namely Garissa Lodge in Nairobi, some city in Cape Town, and third, very briefly, Carmel Souk in Minneapolis. And so in many ways, um, this paper relates to questions of capital around how, focusing on how people find ways of living livable lives within systems of racial capitalism at the margins and carving out spaces of care in, concept, in contexts of enduring and ongoing precarity. Garissa Lodge, um, so first to start with Garissa Lodge in Nairobi. Garissa Lodge in the area of Eastleigh, Nairobi is widely known as the first Somali mall. The history of its establishment is recounted through what is often um, described as the universal story of its emergence, which posits that from the late 1980s, following an increase in the number of refugees arriving in Kenya from neighboring Somalia, 
the two-story residential block began to be used for trade through the sale of goods and clothing purchased in Dubai. At night, the products were stored under beds, while during the day, the bedrooms became shops. During fieldwork in Cape Town, Nairobi and Minneapolis, I was frequently told various versions of the story describing the semi-formal and multi-use nature of this Somali mall. Yet certain details remain common. Garissa Lodge was run and owned by a blind Somali woman named Aisha, uh, or known as Mama Aisha. This was the first mall of its kind formed in the wake of increasing instability in neighboring Somalia. And the practice that began with this building quickly spread to the area as a whole and has expanded with the growth of the diaspora. The area and mall are also predominantly ethnically Somali or East African, and its origins relate to the particular racial and ethnic identity of the area of East Lee in Nairobi as having been historically demarcated as Somali and Asian site in the 1948 British master plan for the city. So the various stories that I was told describe Mama Aisha as both a wealthy and successful Somali refugee woman who runs a profitable business, that is Garissa Lodge, and one who provides a service of care and refuge to those in need and less fortunate than herself, often opening the lodge to those with limited alternative means at no cost. In its narration, the Somali mall more generally evolves in response to protracted crises, the absence of functioning states, and in racialized areas and urban peripheries. Drawing on Homi Baba, the narrative of Garissa Lodge contains both the idea and the spatial model. In hearing the repeated stories in Nairobi, Cape Town and Minneapolis, I argue that, the, that this repeated refrain acts as a form of spatial knowledge to reinforce, construct and engender particular kinds of spaces associated with this diaspora. As my research shows, these markets tend to be located on the urban margins. Yet I also show that they perform the circulation of transnational spatial stories, but also importantly, of material spatial practices, people and goods. Acting, I argue, as an infrastructural system, enabling a form of spatial intimacy across geographies and within contested realms. So I build on the work of Abdumalik Simone's concept of people as infrastructure, yet suggests that beyond thinking through the immaterial networks of improvisation, which Simone emphasizes, these Somali malls tell us about very real spatial and material negotiations that exist and are built by displaced populations. And I suggest in particular that we should think of these as black markets, where blackness is related to both paradigms of subjection, informality and ongoing racialization as part of systems of racial capitalism in different ways in these three sites, but also significantly as spaces of possibility and potential, as spaces of living otherwise despite precarity. So these markets are for the large part um, unremarkable architectures consisting of makeshift spaces built incrementally or adapted from existing structures. And so I use, I talk about care here in different ways. For, for me, the care becomes a framework um, for the study as a strategy for studying a space, a practice, an approach for drawing out how marginalized groups live with precarity and entangled spatial histories. These are not spaces cited in urban or architectural archives as sites of populations who occupy marginal locations. Yet care, so, and so care is partly an, an approach to, under, to thinking of these as architecture, despite being located outside architecture. But care in these markets is also a vital strategy for enduring precarious worlds. So it becomes a framework for paying attention to the ordinary stories that structure the lives of those living through serial forced displacements in a series of Somali malls and learning how to notice and tell the messy, fragmented and patchy stories of their histories. Um, Um, so I'm going to move to Cape Town. So I was first introduced to the concept of a Somali mall and told about Eastleigh in the suburb of Belleville, approximately 25 kilometers north of central Cape Town. Belleville was a former independent city established as a modernist center and Afrikaans rival to the city of to central Cape Town. The area was designated white under the Apartheid Group Areas Act of 1950 
and granted city status in 1979. It was conceived and imagined as the urban cultural heartland of Afrikaners in the Western Cape. From the 1950s onwards, newspapers refer to Belleville as a bastion of apartheid and Afrikaners in the Cape. With the end of apartheid, the area saw significant white flight into neighboring suburbs and gated communities. The restructuring of local government and the formation of the Cape Town Metropolitan Municipality in the early 2000s resulted in the area being integrated into the Cape Town Metro. This change coincided in the early 2000s with an incoming African new entrant population who were drawn to the area by inexpensive rentals and high levels of formal infrastructure. This changing state from a white center to an urban margin in turn produced a space for new, um, for new migrants or new entrants to South Africa. As described at the outside, outset, the term Somali mall refers to multi-story markets that have dominant Somali or East African populations with Garissa Lodge often described as the original. The first Somali mall in South Africa was said to have started in 1998 in Belleville in this area. And in 2015, when I started this research, there were approximately 24 in the wider Belleville area and 14 within this small central district. As with Garissa Lodge described earlier, these are mixed use spaces, including trade, residential accommodation, religious spaces, language schools, and host various other services. Their descriptions as malls does not therefore fully capture the complexity of what they offer. Ahmed, the manager of some city, explained that his idea to start a Somali mall in Belleville was primarily influenced by his experience of Eastleigh in Nairobi. In his narration of the history of some city, he also described a network of interdependence in the sourcing and trade of goods, as most are sourced through cross-border traders or familial networks in Kenya or Dubai, so most uh, in, in Cape Town at least. So these are drawings of two trading spaces in some city of varying sizes, formed from the skeletons of uh, former office buildings which have been subdivided. In particular, within these Somali malls, although many, are, many of the malls themselves are run by men, many of the stores are run by women and known to sell Somali goods, often frequently referred to as women's things. This, cat this categorization points to this, that the stores largely cater to women, carrying with them a gendered understanding of women as both primary caregivers and homemakers. These spaces are densely filled with clothing, cosmetics, groceries, curtains and carpets making the most of all surfaces available. Yet while the parceling of space into small individual shops suggests a reduction in scale, the sourcing of good, goods talks to relationships with spaces and people elsewhere um, on the planet. Um, and maybe also just to mention, so um, part, of, part of my research method was drawing in these spaces um, and drawing and redrawing over the course of two years doing this research. And so this drawing is um, of a shop owned by someone named Fatima. And in many of these stores, long opening hours mean that traders spend most of their days in the shops from at least nine in the morning to nine at night. These spaces become central spaces for looking after families, preparing food for cooking um, and meeting others. And, and Beyond offering social spaces and services, however, these spaces also act as infrastructures of refuge. For example, during nationwide xenophobic violence in South Africa in 2008, the majority of Somali malls in Belleville, including some city, turned their residential lodges into emergency housing for refugees and migrants displaced from other areas at no cost. And similar stories of Somali malls offering refuge emerge from Nairobi, Lusaka, Johannesburg, and Minneapolis suggesting a more nuanced reading of these spaces, but also of the category of the refugee as someone actively responding to displacement rather than only being a passive recipient as often described within humanitarian literature. So while my research points to these markets and malls as sites of care and essential to migrant livelihoods, more generally, contemporary newspapers describe the area as a site of urban decay as crime ridden and run down. The negative perception is often a racialized depiction, largely associated with its black African character. And this dystopic view is shared by the city of Cape Town, where in 2012, a special mayoral committee 
identified Belleville as an area in need of urban regeneration. Between 2012 and 2014, 15 problem buildings, and that's the terminology of the city, were identified and demarcated for eviction. I think important to mention these eviction orders relied on police raids to enforce minor bylaws and remind us of Ananya Roy's assertion that evictions have become a key mechanism of racial displacement. So to be very clear, in the majority of cases, practices within these buildings were not illegal, as noted in interviews with city officials themselves. This dystopic urban image of racialized informality contrasts with the markets as spaces of infrastructural support, refuge or care formed in relation to protracted forced migration, wider urban violence and local refugee policies. So very briefly to move to Minneapolis in the US, the Somali Moors in Cape Town were not only described in relation to Eastley, um, Nairobi, but also to Minneapolis. During the course of field work in Cape Town, I was frequently told of the hope for a third country resettlement largely centered on Minneapolis, which is spoken of as an ideal destination. And I was introduced to Minneapolis and its Somali malls through, through contacts in Cape Town um, in 2015 and later 2018. Karmal Souk, shown here, is the earliest of these Somali malls in the city. Unlike the markets in South Africa, it clearly announces its presence with links to the East African coast and the Middle East and has an old and new part to it. But as with Cape Town and Nairobi, and as with Cape Town and Nairobi, it's largely women who supply stores as cross-border traders. Many of the women who own these stores here have previously had similar stores elsewhere. So the owner of this shop, for example, Abida, had, has previously had um, a shop in Nairobi, Lusaka, and Cape Town before being resettled in Minneapolis. Somali malls in Minneapolis, I argue, are therefore made in the direct image of spaces elsewhere or in all of these sites, in many cases by the same proprietors where the relationships between these spaces are actively maintained through female cross-border traders. Yet despite contextual differences, which of course are significant and this kind of overview doesn't do justice to that, as with Cape Town and Nairobi, these markets are in similarly contested positions as documented in city planning reports in relation to the wider city. I think also interesting to note um, in thinking about care, most of the women I spoke to in Minneapolis work as housekeepers, uh, carers for the elderly or part-time cleaners while also working in these stores. And Nancy Frazier draws our attention to how the work of social reproduction is increasingly outsourced and racialized while it continues to be gendered. The global south and racialized women step in to fill the care gap. So understanding Somali malls as part of a network of outsourced care in the US brings in a wider world of the low wage caring profession. It also returns back to these Somalis malls as spaces of both precarity and possibility, aspects which are not exclusive. So although, um, to, to go back to Carmel, Sue Carmel was fully formal and legal when first opened, both the old and new part are now technically or two years ago, were technically legally non-conforming. And as with sites else described elsewhere, continue to occupy a semi-formal and contested position. The informal and semi-formal nature of these spaces as partially regulated forms of trade and populations points to the production of informality as a device, linked in this case to gendered and racialized forms of labor and work. However, this informality does not necessarily mean that all of the trade is survivalist, local or small scale, as is often assumed a marker. So rendering of these malls as informal um, is part of a process of non-recognition. So to conclude, Garissa Lodge, Sum City and Sukamal, along with other similar spaces, draw our attention to Apache landscape, which enables collaborative survival and interdependency across geographies and with a, within contexts of precarity that exceed national boundaries. These are spaces enmeshed in practices of global capital, yet which remain on the margins. In their narration, they evolve in response to a crisis, the absence of functioning state support, and in racialized areas and urban peripheries. Rather than seeing these 
kinds of spaces as ethnic markets as they might usually be studied within architecture. This research resituates these within architectural history, yet moves beyond the everyday to the minor, marginal, and transnational. And in this paper, recognizing the physical and intangible networks of support and cross-border trade as black markets, enables a view of the centrality of these spaces as infrastructural to the migrant groups um, who, who occupy them and simultaneously points to the longer history of these spatial practices and a longer history of their racialization and marginalization tied into global processes. These networks extend into the manipulation of the physical architectonic fabric and are hosted in distinct material and spatial sites. While often contingent and precarious, these spaces are nevertheless vested in by inhabitants in social, material and cultural terms as spaces for care, of caring for others at the scale of domestic practice and diasporic community. So if the South is usually understood as a space of lack, a form of forcible enclosure and the construction of uninhabitable landscapes following Abdumalik Simon, then care is understood as a means of making holes in this enclosure. And I quote from Simone, it means engaging the makeshift deliberations that residents in overly congested material and affective spaces conduct in order to accord each other some right of way, some space of operation, end of quote. So I argue too that these are not simply ad hoc incidental sites, they have a history which is linked to formal infrastructure, refugee policies, global capital, colonial planning and state dispossession and they are tied into the ongoing racialization of migration and marginalization of these networks and practices, which continues into the present across the global South and North. Adopting a framework of black markets allows us to see a wider and more systemic view of the spatialities and racialization that operates across scales and geographies and the concrete spatial and material infrastructures of what often gets glossed over as informal. Following Anna Singh, we neglect many livelihoods and practices because, because they are not considered part of progress. Looking closely and speaking to inhabitants in Somali malls as a practice of care suggests a method of looking around rather than ahead. In acknowledging that the disciplinary archive is deeply implicated with the racial construction of the world, this research points to a wider form and recognition of where knowledge on the urban margins might be located. Um, within spaces of both precarity and possibility and to certain and points to certain forms of care and sustenance that are not necessarily reducible to or exhausted by mechanisms of control. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, can everybody see my screen? Great, um, wow, thank you for those fascinating presentations. Very, very exciting, um, hard, hard, uh, hard to follow. Um, so I'm, I'm uh, speaking to you today from uh, the place that is colonially called Vancouver, um, but is the unceded territory of the Coast Salish people, um, including the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Um, the image, the two images that uh, that are up on the screen right now are um, of of uh, a project that, um, that that is commonly called Vancouver House. So on the left is a kitchen interior of the of a unit inside this condominium tower, and on the right is um, a, a, a housing project uh, in Cambodia in Phnom Penh. Now, why these pictures are directly related and constitute um, quote unquote one project is that there was a program um, in which every unit that was sold in Vancouver House, so like the unit on the left, another unit was built in this neighborhood in Phnom Penh for a quote unquote uh, deserving family. So um, this was part of what was called the world's first one-to-one -one home gifting program. 
and, and this played a prominent role in the project's marketing. Um, so, so the project marketing listed 20 reasons to purchase a unit in Vancouver House. One of the, the first reason was that it was a super prime property. Um, and reason number 12 was that it came with an on, uh, 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 in-house on-demand fleet of BMWs. And reason number 17 was this one for one, one to one home gifting program. So the citizenship of the buyers um, extended globally. Now, there are many ways to talk about the financialization of architecture, and that's what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, many ways to discuss its sort of uneven global conditions. Today, I'm going to narrowly focus um, on, on the image on the left and what that represents. And that is architecture um, increasingly functioning as an investment asset in the kind of spaces of what we might call high finance. And if you're wondering about what Vancouver House, the Vancouver version, not the Phnom Penh version looks like um, in terms of its massing as an exterior architectural piece in the skyline of Vancouver, the kitchen counter on the left is a miniature replica of the entire building's massing flipped on its side. Now, there are, are um, many different definitions of financialization. One that I like a lot is um, by Greta Krippner in 2005, when she did a landmark study on the financialization of the American economy. And I'm going to read it right now. So financialization, a pattern of accumulation in which profits, profits accrue primarily through financial channels rather than through trade and commodity production. Financial here refers to activities relating to the provision or transfer of liquid capital in expectation of future interests, dividends, or capital gains. Now, I just want to emphasize um, the word liquid here, um, liquid capital, and that's something that I'm going to um, kind of return to in a few minutes later in the presentation. Now, um, you know, there are so many different ways to um, conceptualize and understand buildings. And I find it useful for the discussion of financialization to consider them in the way that's represented in this, in this image right here. And it of course is very rudimentary and elemental and highly contested. We can, you know, is, is this the best way? Very debatable, has its own pros and cons. But if we think that buildings from the beginning of time ever, you know, from, from, from the most simple buildings to the most extravagant buildings always by necessity serve some sort of cultural role, serve some sort of shelter role, and always through their labor and materiality embody some version of wealth. Um, one of the basic attributes of the era of financialization, which uh, many observers, I mean, we can say that finance is, uh, is of course, um, an always present component of capital, um, you know, from its very inception. But many observers, of course, identify around 1980 as a, a, a time in which a set of practices and policies of neoliberalism usher in a period of heightened financialization. And one of the characteristics of this period of heightened financialization is the unprecedented rise of, of, um, of assets under management in the world. Um, there are various ways to kind of uh, measure that, but there's a kind of unanimous position that this, this is increased, increased in within mainstream economics. Now, why is this relevant for architecture? It's relevant for architecture because Buildings are one of the primary mediums for the absorption and deployment of this, uh, of this kind of immense pool, a uh, giant pool of capital or wall of capital. Now, this, this to such a degree that it, that it arguably can be made that if we buy for a moment or run with a moment, this kind of triumvirate um, condition of buildings, that the wealth function, the wealth role, um, is, is, is magnified to such a degree that it repositions the relationship it has with shelter and culture. And in some instances, it can be argued, begins to overshadow and, and dominate that. Um, and, and you know the results of this are, are myriad and legend. Um, 
you know, from the contemporary perversions of spatial wealth storage as witnessed here in, in, a, in a section drawing of a, of a proposed iceberg mansion, uh, you know, so-called so, so iceberg mansion in London to something like the, uh, you know, what I call ex-urban investment mats that really function of vehicles of mortgage generation and subsequent securitization witnessed here uh, on the edges of Mexico City. Um, but I want to I want to I want to return to this moment, this question of liquidity that that Greta uh, positioned so well in her definition. So if we go, if we look inside the kind of different versions of, of inside finance, like the, a website like investopedia.com, this is their definition of liquidity. Liquidity refers to the efficiency or ease with which an asset or security can be converted into ready cash without affecting its market price. The most liquid asset of all is cash itself. Now, coupled with that definition of, of uh, liquidity, uh, Investopedia has you know, a, a three minute tutorial to help explain, you know, drive home the concept um, to help us all become you know, adept and agile investors. And to illustrate the point, they, show, they, they describe what is a non-liquid asset. And this is their representation of what that non-liquid asset is. So within the logics of finance, that the, the most quintessential non-liquid asset is this. So, uh, you know, a representation of a, of a, a detached home um, as real estate. Now, of course, what this means is that liquidity could be understood or is understood commonly on a spectrum, right? So cash at one end, the most liquid asset and real estate at the other end, the most illiquid asset, non-liquid asset. Now, sitting in between that spectrum is every possible thing that one can treat as an as a asset. So close to cash, but not quite far along as, as cash are, are stocks in corporations like Microsoft, Apple, and uh, further down the spectrum towards real estate, but not quite as far down as real estate is a painting. If you want to invest in painting, as we know, the art market is one of the most um, you know, intense and, and insipid uh, domains of, of, of free market speculation. Now, I want to hear just, I've put in the, the, the kind of commonly used maxim or credo in, in kind of real estate culture, all real estate is local. And this is historically kind of captures what is illiquid about it. And I would argue it's its localness and all that en encompasses that localness that makes it illiquid, right? So it exists in a complex socio-cultural context, unique climate, um, you know, unique set of neighbors, unique set of, um, you know, um, pollution conditions, atmospheric conditions, so on and so forth. Now, you know, going back to this process, this ongoing process of financialization that Greta speaks about, this provision of liquid capital, this exchange of liquid capital. I, I would like to posit, I mean, I'm not the only one who posits this, but for our discussion today, that the forces of financialization, the phenomena of financialization attempt, they work to move real estate along the spectrum closer and closer to cash, closer and closer, closer to stocks. And this is a, you know, a, a, a kind of a thing that is enmeshed with a whole set of structural challenges within the logics of capitalism um, that, that produce all sorts of outcomes. So, so what are the ways in which real estate becomes more liquid, becomes less local? Um, there, there are so many um, to list just four. Um, of course, they are technological. And I think thing is software uh, and, and applications like Zillow or Airbnb are a, a big component of this. Um, they are, of course, legal. Um, the very invention, uh, it's not a worldwide invention, but in many places that is a, a condominium, which is a legal uh, invention from the 1960s, relatively new, doesn't become widely popular until the 1990s, which is uniquely allows fee simple ownership in a stacked formation until this invention in, in Western 
um, cultures, the predominant form of ownership was always tied to the land. Anything that was vertically stacked was, uh, was, was um, the individual unit was in a co-op a co or rental or subsidized housing in which there was no direct ownership of that, of that unit. And then of course, financial proper with the invention of mortgage-backed securities, which are a relatively recent invention, um, real estate investment trusts, uh, again, a relatively recent invention. And these, uh, these in financial uh, instruments uh, tether the physicality of real estate to the very um, kind of delocalized markets of exchange. In concert with this um, is, the, uh, is architectural form itself. So I think all of these things, technological, legal, financial, formal, are working in their own ways in concert to move real estate towards becoming closer to a liquid thing like cash. So there are many um, architectural kind of avatars of this financialization, what we might call financialized architecture. Um, I'm gonna just uh, quickly uh, talk about uh, uh, um, the, the, what has become referred to as uh, pencil towers, uh, most famously being constructed in Midtown Manhattan. Here is a very small sampling of, of uh, some housing projects uh, that, tip, that cater to well-off demographics, quote unquote, um, from 1965 to the present. Um, and there's no, no debate that there is an increasing prevalence of slenderness, a kind of preoccupation with slenderness within the logics of, of financialized form. At the right is uh, a project that is nearing completion, 111 West 57th in New York City by Shop Architects. And, um, you know, and here is its section. Um, it is uh, the, 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 the world's second tallest residential building. Um, and, and remarkably, it only has 58 units, and it's the thinnest skyscraper in the world with a, with a ratio of 1 to 24. Um, so almost all the units in the building occupy either one entire floor or two floors. Now, here's a, a kind of typical floor um, showing one unit. This one's on the market right now. I just grabbed it from uh, real estate listings yesterday. I think this one's going for $22 million, asking $22 million. And I, I, I want to um, argue that the units within a building like this, like the one we're looking at, are the apotheosis of liquid assets in how they are delocalized. So this is most pronounced in how they are isolated from the messy unpredictability of sensate contact with other humans. Gone is the hallway and its chance encounters. Um, gone are the possibility of witnessing the sight, smell, and sound of other human beings. Far above the public ground, these desocialized increments of speculative wealth storage are ensured um, by their very proportionality, right? So, so these isolated entities within the sky. So in exchange for the, uh, or in place of contact with other humans, interaction with the ground, things like the view um, take on this kind of mythical role of, of, of a sort of semblance of locality. In the marketing literature for this project, it's bragged how it is uh, centrally positioned in relation to Central Park, uh, commanding not only a kind of uh, a, a view of the whole park, but, but this kind of um, you know, optimized view that is on center. And in addition, even though these things are quite, we might think are quite rudimentary, I think they're quite powerful in this move towards illiquidity, um, things like maintenance and security, right? If we think of that single or that detached home that has a, that has a roof directly connected to its interior and habitation, and that that roof is prone to failure and necessitates maintenance, that the ground around it necessitates um, work and labor to keep it up. The, 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 the slender tower in its very proportionality minimizes all of these kind of possibilities for um, physical engagement. One micro roof for 58 units under it, right? So you have this kind of not only a desocialization that happens within this form, 
but a kind of reduction of the necessity for even um, care and upkeep in what has historically within housing been very dominant spaces of care and upkeep. And I think that's very significant. And, and, uh, and let's not forget the kind, of, um, the, the kind of perception of security and isolation with the single asset, with the single entries and all the kind of layers of, of entrance and, and observation. And in parallel to this, of course, these units are, are, are well documented to be often purchased by legal structures that are further desocializing. So they're often purchased by uh, numbered companies that conceal who, who the actual owners are. Inter um, complex chains of intermediaries are used in the purchasing and exchanges. So it's actually very difficult to trace in many instances who owns them, where the money's coming from, and all of that. And, um, and I think condominium itself, and it's no, it's no uh, accident that uh, most all, all of these are condominiums, is a legal structure that facilitates this, uh, this kind of um, hyper privatization of exchange, unlike in something like a co-op. So all of this kind of legal structuring in chains of intermediaries work in concert with the proportionality to uh, render these, uh, what I kind of refer to as an apotheosis of liquid financialized architecture. Now, of course, um, you know, they're, they're incredibly extreme in their manifestation, but I think it allows us to see this antithesis to localness very clearly, but then can be traced in different formations. It's not only in tall buildings. So, uh, for example, here, One Hyde Park in London, um, also uh, kind of, you know, strategically locating itself next to their version of Central Park um, has a, a similar logic of thinness and desocialization and can almost be thought of as a slender tower broken apart into four discrete uh, pieces that are arrayed across the ground. Um, and when you look at the kind of morphological drawings associated with it, this is from the architect themselves, like the first drawing that they used to describe the project. This is the yellow is representing arrows and aspect. And it's all to demonstrate how it ensures that um, when these units are occupied, that, uh, that there will be no way in which to, in to see and, and to kind of witness any neighborly proximity. Um, and of course, they're also coupled with uh, individual privatized elevators and all of that kind of thing. So all this kind of morphological work going to uh, towards isolation and separation. Um, in in uh, this is an image, uh, an axonometric drawing of a project in Vancouver, Aquarius. Um, also, it's one project with four condominium towers that rise out of a podium base, um, and and and. Um, you know, when you again look at the history of uh, proportional morphology of housing in a city like Vancouver, there's no question that the advent of point towers in the era of financialization is, is another um, more subtler than something like 111 West 57th, but a uh, device nonetheless that helps uh, diminish and enervate uh, sensate contact potentialities. Um, and interestingly, you know, all of this um, kind of uh, delocalization, I argue, is, is compensated uh, through a set of kind of formal aesthetic tropes that compensate for um, what I would call like actual complexity of human interactions with a kind of morphological complexity in many instances through shape and increasingly the misuse of ostensible nature um, in the guise of sustainability, but really, uh, I think, masking the kind of operations of, of uh, turning these units into optimal um, asset formations. So to go back to this diagram, I think like, what are we, you know, as architects, um, just maybe, maybe as a kind of provocation, I think, um, you know, I think it's necessary, or I think there's a lot of exciting opportunity for us to turn our critical gaze towards uh, operating simultaneously within the technological, legal, and financial, and formal realms. That these are all territories for architectural op or operation. 
and uh, that afford, uh, well, they come with their, with, with, with their risks and are very dangerous and, and not easy to navigate, but um, are, 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 I think, uh, territories in which we increasingly need to operate simultaneously. And, um, and dangerously, I'm going to just end by showing you, uh, 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 unfortunately, very tiny snippets of, of two, two projects, very tiny, but just um, student projects. So this is uh, a, a project by uh, a pair of students at the GSD that attempted to, to look at financialized housing and consider how modulations in existing legal codes around um, around uh, 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 philanthropy and, uh, and sort of tax sheltering could be thought of in concert with formal manipulation of units to produce a kind of revisitation of the interior in which uh, units kind of double function as uh, occasional social spaces in which tax exemptions operate and serve a, a kind of permutation of, of, of the investment logics. Um, or uh, this project that looks at accelerating the role of digital renderings as speculative tools, which I think they, they really have become, to, to create uh, a quarantined market uh, for investment that is entirely severed from physical construction. So a kind of, um, um, a kind of attempt to, um, to, to isolate and quarantine the, the, the massive logics of finance in, in which we might find ourselves where speculative render clouds uh, replace the physicality of, of, of buildings like 111 West 57th and potentially provide new openings for architecture elsewhere. So that's it. Thank, thank you all so much. Totally fabulous and um, what an opportunity. Um, uh, we, we were um, hoping to have enough time to have um, the speakers talk to each other um, and ask each other questions and hopefully do that in a succinct fashion so that the participants can also ask you questions. So I don't know how to, how to make that um, all, all timely, but may, maybe, maybe just to start um, with, with any of you speakers to see if there's kind of an urgent connection that you wanna draw um, between your, your talks and your focus and someone else's that needs to be pulled out that may not have been obvious to us speakers. So um, I go ahead. If... I, I would just say very quickly that the extremely thin um, skyscraper that uh, Matthew sort of concludes the cycle with uh, to me sort of uh, harken, you know, it, I sort of connected it back to capitalism's reliance, ultimate reliance on property and land. And this is an extremely uh, efficacious uh, exploitation and use of that land. Um, and, and perhaps compare or contrast that uh, with the examples that Huda provided in which there's no, um, there, there's no sense of rationalizing um, that um, or, 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 or being extremely efficacious with, with, with that um, occupation of the land, but that are guided by different parameters. Um, so I sort of just uh, first initial thought uh, uh, but looking forward to later conversation. I mean, to pick up on what Ana Maria just said, I think another thing that's it's striking to me is that the, the, the terrifying luxury of 111 57th Street and the kind of wonderful marginality of, of the Somali Mall, they are part of the same system of uneven development in which the wealth is extracted from some places and accumulated in other places. And these are places that these two buildings, the, the pencil tower and, and, and the black market, exemplif they, they exemplify them, but they, they also emerge from, the, from these different places. So that um, the, 
the, as Ana Maria says, they, they, the, these, the, these two buildings architecturally have, are, you know, are in some ways so, so different, and yet they're part of that, that, that same system. Yeah, yeah, abs absolutely. And I, and I, and I mean, the, the, the Vancouver House project that I started with is such a perverse, um, dark illustration of, of literalism of, of that, you know? And, 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 and I mean, it's really interesting to me how um, the, the kind of logics and, and ideologies of, of, of ultra wealth uh, kind of play themselves out in this regard. And, and I, I find philanthropy a very uh, kind of dark and perverse version of this, you know, um, that pro provides sort of ethical ethical cover, seeming, you know, an attempt at ethical cover. I mean, these purchasers of Vancouver House, some of them literally went to Cambodia to hand the keys, you know, as the, you know, and have photo, these photo ops. But anyway, Andrew, and Andrew, Andrew and Anna, I, I'm curious um, to hear, I loved your presentation in, in especially on, on the Jeffersonian, well, the different versions of the grid. And I'm curious to hear you speculate on how I mean, obviously the omnipresence of the grid and all that it represents shapes so much of the world we inhabit. And how, how, do, you, how do you think that um, kind of, I'm just curious to hear some of your thoughts on how that translates to let's say the scale of a building. You know, because I, I mean, that to me is very interesting. Like the kind of, the, the, the kind of geographic, the kind of telescoping, right? The, the sort of national ge geographies of the grid and then the kind of neighborhood geographies of the grid and then the, the, the sort of architectural obsessions with the grid. You know, I, I, I I'm sorry, I'm, I, I'm good. I, I should let you answer that. And I'm just, I'm just um, want to make sure that we get, we get to some of the questions from the participants, but, um, but before doing that, you know, Raj um, or Huda, if, if either of you have just quick comments or observations about, about connections or, or gaps. Um, I know. I mean, I, I, I also find this, utterly fascinating it's, it's interesting to see um you know in in uh, the architectural pornography of of what the ultra rich are up to in vancouver to compare it for example to india where uh there's always space for there, there are always servants quarters uh in these towers uh and it's interesting to me that uh as these financial you know the, the financial institutions that that uh, sponsor these towers are mining the sky, uh, and these are the same institutions that, of course, will mine uh, the, the you know and restructure loans in uh, working class areas, uh, and you know are engaged. As I think Saskia Sasson has a nice line on this about how how you know essentially finance is the the act of sort of twenty first century mining um, in uh, in certain kinds of space. I'm, I'm interested, uh, and I, I wonder this is, whether there's a question for you, Huda, of how it is that you're seeing uh, reproductive labor uh, feature in the the sort of space, the spaces that you're, you're you know, that, that for, and I know for a fact that they're in South Africa as well, uh, how it is that reproductive labor is bolted on in certain areas, or whether it's in the inter inter interstices like, you know, Abash Lali Bas and John Dolo, the Shack Dwellers movement, uh, is uh, an organization that, that forms through the requirements of middle classes to have reproductive labor available cheaply, but ne not necessarily on site. Uh, and I, I wonder if there's a sort of spatial uh, geography around finance and care that uh, is also part of this ultra rich discussion, but again, is being is, is occluded in uh, some of these, you know, some of these architectural plans, but is nonetheless part of the discussion always. Um, thanks. Yeah, no, that's a really, I mean, I think um, it's a really good point to raise. And I guess, uh, I, yeah, South African cities are incredi incredibly segregated. And so I think the comment that both Andrew and, and Anna Maria raised about thinking about these kinds of spaces together is relevant. Well, because it's, it's uh, separated within South African cities, as well as um, talking about these kind of global centers and peripheries. Um, and I think yeah, uh, I think there's a lot more to be said about that, though, and what it means to think about these, the kinds of effective, yeah, the kinds of creation of townships as labor camps, as 
um, spaces of dispossession that are constructed and maintained in, in post-apartheid South Africa. Um, but uh, yeah, maybe just as a kind of general comment though, in relation to for the others, I think there's, there's so many really interesting connections and um, things to draw out from the presentations. But I think one thing I was really struck with is at the towards the end of um, Anna Maria's presentation and Andrew's presentation is this comment of thinking about writing hi history as a decolonizing practice, and I think that's something that's kind of yeah thread throughout, but also ways of what it means to think about the dispossession of history, um, especially when thinking about the global south and how that goes along with the dispossession of land and and these kinds of deep histories that are continuously forgotten um in the present and yeah um but yeah thanks um we were going to break out into home base um discussions to bring forward uh questions to you but but i think it's more efficient at this point if we just do a um questions via stack um in 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 the chat um and just to say, personally, I've been struck both in the readings that you um, all had us read and, and the tapes and videos and all the discussions is how much two things matter. And one you've identified, which is the earth, you know, just the earth, the land itself, the earth is the condition that, you know, in, in primitive accumulation supposedly is the, is the beginning, but it keeps being the end. It's just, it's just so interesting. But the other is, is representation, you know, that I think in almost every case, there are different forms of representation that make us think about theory or what theory's obligation is, what should be brought forward in, in a different way. Um, and so I'm struck by, by what you bring to the fore as things to look at to tell us the stories. It's, it's just super interesting. Um, so Priyanka, are you there? Yeah. yeah. Do you, do you think yes. it's right that we just maybe just yes. move to questions in? Okay. Yes, yes. I think so, it's okay. better use of our time. Even okay. if we uh, spill over a little past six o'clock, uh, you know, anyone who absolutely has to leave, uh, okay. feel free, but this discussion might get past a little. Okay. So I'll let you um, manage the stack. Sure, sure. sure. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, let's jump right in with a, um, uh, you know, ado. Caitlin? You're up on staff. Hello, um, I'm Caitlin. Um, I'm a city planner in Montana and my scope is really local. So feel free to broaden it, but I'll just ask my question. I guess it's mainly to Raj. Um, a thing that we've been dealing with our housing crisis here in Montana is kind of this um, uh, agricultural land soil advocates versus affordable housing and kind of uh, developers kind of like pinning them against each other. Um, do you have opinions on that? Does that make sense? Um, thank you. Sh should I just jump jump in super quickly with a with a response, Priyanka? Yes. Yes. Okay. Please. Um. Well, th th thank you, Caitlin. Uh, I mean, it's um, you know, that this at, at some level, of course, uh, the the question is, what is land for and for whom? Um, and uh, th there's a uh, a very good book called Fields of Gold that, that sort of coins the term by, by Madeleine Fairbanks. And, and she, she, she writes about how uh, at the moment land is like gold with yield. Uh, and that, that's a theme that's sort of come up a great deal in all of our uh, uh, talks is uh, how it is that, that land functions as an asset. Uh, and, you know, that's why Bill Gates, uh, philanthropist extraordinaire, is also America's largest farmer. Uh, he owns the, you know, more farm, farmland than anyone else, uh, not because uh, he can be found chewing straw on the farm, but because it is uh, an important and valuable asset. Um, the tension then between uh, industrial agriculture and urban housing uh, and, and affordable housing, I think, is, is a real one. Uh, and in part, uh, what, what's hidden behind this is uh, a crisis of pensions. Uh, right now, we're going through uh, one of the largest land redistributions in, uh, uh, you know, in U.S. history, as the average age of a farmer is 68, I think. Um, and as farmers wonder how they're going to be able to afford health care uh, and they're going to be able to leave a legacy, uh, they are selling to asset managers uh, and to people like Cascade Investments um, or Cascadia Investments, which is Bill Gates' fund. Um, in this moment, 
we've got what, what appears to be a tension between you know industrial agriculture that operates on vast scales uh, and the, the absolute need for affordable housing. And, and it seems to me that, that the answer to this is neither to uh, engage in the kinds of warehousings uh, of people that uh, you know that, that uh, the property developers would, would find most remunerative, um, nor to engage in large-scale uh, insistences on in, uh, large-scale industrial agriculture, but to break down uh, both the needs for low-carbon, zero-carbon farming that's urban and peri-urban with uh, housing that reconnects humans with the web of life and with the you know the bloody colonialism beneath our feet, uh, and that's that involves a, a, re, a, a reconfiguration of how uh, you know. Uh, social housing and how uh, uh, farming has to happen. And that, that, that there need to be transformations in both. In farming, I can talk about agroecology being uh, a much better way of using land, but it's much more labor intensive. Um, but if we are interested in eating in the 21st century, then that's the kind of agriculture we need. And so, you know, the, the long story short, Ken, I mean, I think that the answer has to rely both in transformations in the way that we think about what, uh, how farm land works and for whom, uh, with respect, you know, respecting ancient histories of colonial and modern histories of how to care for elders in a way that is also consonant with um, you know, finding housing for people in, in places where they want to be. I don't think there's an easy answer, but there are lots of difficult ones. Thank you, that was great. Uh, the next person on is Will Levine. Yeah, my question is for Matthew. Um, so right now, the um, in this week of Canadian housing news, the biggest story is that um, core development out of Toronto is looking to buy 4,000 rental properties all across Canada in a $1 billion buyout. Um, and everybody's very worried because it's gonna drive up rent all across the country. Um, and you posited that the real estate market is an illiquid thing and it might be moving to more liquid. When you count rent, as a function of, a, of an inexhaustible need, which is the need for housing for profit, would you count rent as moving real estate towards a more liquid form? You're muted, Matthew. My gosh, you th you'd think we'd be doing this so long that I would know how to not to unmute. But um, thank you for your question. Um, yeah, that has been big news, news in, in, in Canada. I think what's what's interesting is um, you know the the type of move that this this is or uh, represents in Canada has uh, been unfolding in the United States for quite a while and um, with large uh, asset funds uh, like Blackstone Group and whatnot buying large amounts of housing often in uh, neighborhoods that have historically been quite disenfranchised racialized neighborhoods poor neighborhoods and um, you know this the the way in which the this housing stock under these large companies is often managed i think and operated is extremely problematic and heightens disenfranchisement and uh and i think is part of a process of uh moving that housing stock towards greater liquidity in how it's sort of operated so you have uh, the 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 these companies that kind of um increasingly uh, delocalize their contact with the housing, this kind of technological deployments of things like remote key access, standardizing, uh, like the, the, the renters can go there to the house without ever being shown around, um, how all the materials are standardized across them. And, and, and all of this seems to result in, um, again, a kind of desocialization and heightened abstraction um, so I think their pursuit of large scale um, rental returns on these assets is managed in such a way that moves that stock towards being um, more, more liquid. Yeah, that's identical with the experience I've had in Madison, even all the apartment buildings are owned by the same company and made with the same materials and they're homogenizing rental properties. It's kind of odd. Well, that's a yeah. good answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your question. Okay, the next question up is Emma Healy. Hi, thank you for those um, talks. I was just reflecting on um, actually um, Huda's um, talk about Batima's shop and 
thinking about how well it demonstrates a lot of ingenuity and like a deep humanism um, and the kind of merging of cooking and caregiving, life and work and all of this sort of stuff. I also thought, you know, there's still um, aspects of selling the debris of capitalism and long hours and lack of privacy and dehumanizing aspects within that, um, I suppose, situation and arrangement. And applying that to something that Raj posed, that question of um, how is it that we might resist um, these forces? I wondered, like, how do we grapple with the deep personal toll of resistance when we're working within these systems um, that ultimately I think falls on the most marginalized? Um, I, yeah, thanks. I think that's a really great point. And I think, um, yeah, I think it's really important to not kind of valorize these sorts of spaces. So as much as recognizing them as spaces of refusing certain systems or ways of working or making livable lives, um, as also to understanding that, that the, the wider precarity and that they're not often uh, made out of choice. Um, and I think yeah, I, I think it's a difficult kind of um, balance to to kind of maintain and think about what it means to 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 both understand that they're part of wider systems, but also to sort of actually give them a space and recognize what it mean. What does it mean um, to yeah to recognize the kinds of practices that happen within? Uh, as I think I I read it as spaces offer possibility um, and not just as someone reading it, but also through what was what is told to me about these. So um, in these markets are often the way they're spoken about is as spaces of, of a kind of hope for another kind of life of, of possible social mobility of possible of a possible different future. And um, and I think that, yeah, that difference between the reality and the possibilities is really yeah, where it's like um, uh, uh, important to kind of yeah recognize the distinction, um, but I think yeah I, I think the on the on the the difficulties I think understanding them within these wider systems. So in terms of thinking through like wider care work and low wage care work or other forms of labor that are involved um, is also part of like understanding that they're not they're not ideal spaces as much as they might offer possibilities at certain points thank you um but just one message anyone who's not muted uh and not speaking could you mute, mute yourself please? um and I'm going to pull, we have a running Google Doc on the side um, and there are some questions uh, here. Uh, Wes Willison, I can read out your question uh, if you don't want to pose it yourself. Um, uh, but you're I can pose it myself. Yeah, please, please go ahead, yeah. Yeah, this idea of architecture being deployed as cover for capital, that's, that's what I'm interested in. So what Matthew is describing, um, but sort of forms sort of more in the, in the um, something approaching a more ethical stance, right? Like the one for one of like, look, we're deploying these like alternative ways of being just or, or ways of like it's Juneteenth, of course, right? This is a great example. Um, that architecture could be subsumed in this same dialectic of like using these representations as masks um, for an underlying like lack of justice or perpetuated injustice and oppression by means of capital. And I'm wondering, I guess, is Marxist critique still the, the same tool when deployed on, on architecture or is there a specific form um, or even an alternative that's more appropriate when we're when we're examining architecture and colonialism. Um, I'm curious what 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 everyone thinks about that, but I'll, I think um, well well. In some ways, I, it's a great question, I, I think, and 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 gets at the crux of so, so many aspects of of it. And I and I think, I mean, your question makes me think of, um, I mean, it makes me think of the the, the renowned Marxist art historian, architectural historian Manfredo Tafuri, um, 
you know, in his kind of uh, repositioning of the architectural avant-garde as, uh, you know, something that uh, for all of its efforts and, and at moments kind of aspirations of, of kind of criticality and desires to go beyond uh, uh, capitalism in some instances, of course, we didn't have that aspiration at all, but only, only kind of you know, served served uh, sometimes unwittingly to kind of move the project of capitalism forward into kind of new new uh, new territories and, and new kind of aesthetic colonializations and actual colonializations. So I, I think I mean it's it's such a difficult question that you pose. I mean I think as designers we we, we have to ask be asking ourselves constantly the ways in which we're we're, we're implicated and and how we do what we do and what we draw um is is in all likelihoods unfortunately in many some ways going to be uh moving things in a direction that we don't want to and i think the, the first is to real to kind of implicate ourselves as part of the the problem that it's so hard to operate outside of and so i think you know, the kind, the way in which architectural discourse has often positioned something like sustainability and ecological interest. Um, you know, there are very different manifestations and di very different, uh, it's hard to, I don't wanna oversimplify it, but I think in many instances, we could make the case that, that um, the kind of uh, measurable ecological benefit is something that is quite questionable in relation to the financial and and uh, kind of accumulation logics that work in concert to it, and I think, you know, that question extent. I mean, so much of uh, contemporary urbanism in a country like Canada, but increasingly elsewhere or, or elsewhere, around um, these kind of perceived ethical exchanges where you do one thing here and you get social housing there or public art there. I mean. I think it's deeply, deeply problematic. And I'm curious what others might think about what the right or what optimal theoretical lenses to unpack that would be. But it's a great question. I would just quickly add that, sorry, Priyanka, do you, were you going to? No, I was just going to offer a resource, but after you. Uh, I, I, I would just, sure. I would just quickly add that, um, you know, th there's been an ongoing conversation post Marxism and, and, and ongoing critiques. Andrew mentioned some, Huda, Rash, uh, Matthew also, uh, which have built on and, and augmented and edited and critiqued uh, Marxist theory. And I think we're on that ongoing conversation of the things that were left behind, uh, the different types of labor, like um, Huda mentioned social reproduction theory. Um, Andrew mentioned MSSR, right? So, so we, we've, I, I think there's an ongoing conversation of uh, trying to understand these processes and the invisibilizations and omissions uh, that happen in Marxist theory. That's one point. Very quickly on, on Tafuri, Tafuri um, rightly uh, reminds us to always ask our position as architects, as critics uh, in um, the means of production, right? Um, but I think that one um, way in which we sometimes fall through the cracks is uh, by trying to resist or oppose um, capitalism in capitalism's terms. Um, and, and what I just quickly mean by that, I don't know if I can phrase it very quickly, is that we, I don't think we can do that. I think that the, the, the avenues and paths for resistance will not have, let's say a market value that capitalism will understand. Um, so that what we can do to resist to, to escape or, 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 or to sort of uh, delink from capitalism will not have a value that capitalism will understand, will not happen in those terms um, and, and will seek for other relations that happen in a different, ha have another type of value uh, to use a Marxist term. So I'll stop there.
uh, before I move, I was just going to offer a reference, uh, which is this book called Winners Take All by Anand Giridhar Das, uh, which kind of speaks, I, I think, to a more popular audience about uh, philanthropy and kind of, you know, reputation laundering through philanthropy. And one of the reasons it's kind of, you know, has particular relevance for architecture, especially right now with the opioid crisis, is that there is a Sackler gallery designed by an extremely famous architect in every museum in the world. It would not be a stretch to say that. Um, and, and so we are kind of directly implicated even in something like this. Um, and, and, and so I find that uh, this book kind of broadens that uh, uh, philanthropic discourse a little bit more, at, at least from our lens, which has always been quite narrow. Um, Aaron, do you want to ask your question? Sure. I mean, I think uh, Anna Maria really just kind of touched on that anyway. Sure. But I was just wondering a little bit about um, whether, our, whether or not our focus on capitalism actually kind of skirts the question about um, or reproduces the kind of same historical separation that Anna Maria and Andrew were, were touching upon at the beginning about this histor historical separation between or this tendency to separate um, colonialism from capitalism and how that really relates to what Matthew was talking about, um, you know, like delocalization um, and the separating from, from, from land, from people, from, from the local in favor of the kind of uh, uh, all-seeing system, right? So if our, our, if our focus then on capitalism as a system, or even let's say style as a system or any kind of system, any depoliticized system that we teach about in architecture actually misses the mark um, in the sense that it skirts the local, the community, land-based experiences, extractions, et cetera, altogether. Um, so I'm saying this, you know, hyper self-critical <laughs> as someone who put, helped put, put this um, school together, but I wonder if actually focusing on capitalism and the system itself is problematic um, and how we teach about it in the academy. But I think you have to understand the system. I mean, because the system doesn't want, the, the system wants to be invisible and, and a given, right? So it's not a question. Um, I don't know, that's the very quick answer. Maybe also to say that the, the, the capitalism is, is, is so deeply sedimented that the, 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 the local, the, the community-based um, and, and, and the, the, these kinds of other alternatives that you mentioned there and are, 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 are themselves implicated, albeit in different ways, in th that system. I mean, to, to me, the, and this touches upon something that maybe I, I hear, maybe I'm projecting, but maybe I hear in, in, in a lot of these questions, which is the, 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 the distinct and, and maybe even mutu mutually exclusive possibilities of refusing uh, or retreating from power, from, from capital, even from the land, versus recapturing, reclaiming uh, uh, power, capital, and land. I mean, the, the Tafuri's retreat um, um, from architecture um, was, was a consequence of a, of a kind of d despair over the, the, the possibilities of recapturing power, capital, and land in, 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 in the world he was, he was living in. Now, I think, you know, obviously we, that's, we, um, that doesn't um, kind of resonate with our experiences because we see the marginal, the hybrid, the, 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 um, the minor, um, these, these kinds of um, 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 spaces of possibilities that are, that are unevenly distributed you know, in, 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 within the system's rifts and, and contradictions and, and, and holes. Um, I'll leave it at that. I, I'm just gonna jump in quickly and, and um, say that I think one of the um, things that Aaron's question makes me think about is Jameson's article that, um, that Matthew had us read, which kind of was insisting that we can't separate those things. Um, and that when we think about style or form, um, we have to in some way understand it as a um, not too subliminal expression of those mechanisms, so. 
I think this is what Matthew, in a way, demonstrated with the section and the plan of that building. And, and I'll quickly now sort of, Matthew, a answer that question about the grid, because the, the, the grid in itself, it's not like the grid is bad, right? Uh, of course, but, but, but uh, it, it, was used, it was mobilized as a tool um, uh, by Jefferson as, as like a great tool of the imagination, right? There was almost nobody there. And with the grid, he processes, right? He says, okay, I, I extend this grid. It's all because I have mapped it. Um, so, so it's a, a great example of the use of an architecture tool to occupy and, and acquire the land, similar to the section that, that, that you're showing to us. And I, when I included that sort of image of weaving, it was because this fantastic artist and, and museum director, Elvira Espejo, uh, who, who is Bolivian and indigenous Bolivian, I, of Aymara and Quechua, ancestry, she explains that the, the grid to her, she, she doesn't mention the grid, but, but these weavings are really complex grids. And she says, it's not meant to be representation. It's the result of a process. It's not representing something. So it's the same tool. So here is form, which is you know, a tool of the architect, used the same form, used in very different ways. And, 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 and I guess that, that's, that's the, the that, that's how we can understand the same tool used in different ways. We have Nathaniel Nelson up on stack. Yeah. Um, so I know everyone has pretty much touched on aspects of my question. It's really one about um, scale and priorities, right? So capitalism and colonialism are successful because they operate on such a global scale and in such a su such a way that's I'll say top down right and the best way that I'm hearing to sort of um, push against and resist this is is bottom up right I know this is much more complicated than how I'm presenting it but we're running out of time so um, I my question really is um, how can how can specific localities through bottom up Right? How do we collect collectively engage top down to like, I, I think there's a really uh, interesting sort of paradox. How do you fight top down with bottom up when top down is more quote unquote organized with a grid that stretches across the entire world, right? Like what are, are there different sort of case studies that you see in action? How do we basically just avoid the global crisis that the top down is um, really you know, escalating as we see with Raj's presentation, all these things are escalating at such a huge scale. Ideally, we resist with the bottom up, like keeping things moving locally, right? The money materials, labor is, is much more local, but you know, does that really stop the crisis that is going to be coming whether we like it or not? Can I jump in uh, to take the first stab at that and, and sort of build on a few of the other answers that um, that, that have been uh, suggested? I mean, one way of tackling this is uh, in the same way that, for example, uh, I'm, and I'm thinking about you haven't uh, declared your pronouns, but I'm guessing he, him. Uh, and if if that's, you know, th then, then you and I are joined in the struggle to flay patriarchy out of ourselves until we die, right? That's that's just a thing that we're going to be doing, and that's a good thing. Um, but the, uh, you know, we can either undertake this as a kind of personal therapy, and we will go see a therapist, and we'll we'll, we'll have conversations about it once a week, and then monitor ourselves, or we can uh, understand this as practice uh, practices of resistance and liberation. Uh, in which case, we have to be doing it collectively. One of the reasons to study capitalism and its origins is to understand that from 1492 onwards, there's always been resistance. Uh, it's not just that uh, capitalism has come along and the, the grid has been imposed and people are like, yeah, all right, fine, uh, until we can organize a union, that's what's going to happen. There's always been fights. And part of the reason to study capitalism is to understand its battles uh, and to understand how it is that, uh, for example, fights against labor exploitation were also always 
uh, fights against um, uh, colonialism. So here, for example, in Texas, Emma Tenayuka uh, was uh, a, uh, you know, involved in the Texas uh, pecan workers struggle, uh, both as a struggle for workers' rights, also for women's rights, also for the rights of immigrants, uh, and also you know, as part of an ongoing fight against border patrol. So th these, you know, th there are movements everywhere and labor is a really important part of this but it's never always been only labor though, though as i say let's unionize and then we can you know we can find our comrades elsewhere as well but uh, the, you know, the, the there's always been these long histories of people sticking it to capitalism and capitalism has encouraged us to forget part of our work is to recognize how it is that we have become uh, you know, patriarchal, for example, you and I, uh, but also the uh, understand how our racial subjectivities and our class subjectivities have put us in this place. And, you know, uh, and particularly for architects, I don't envy you because you, you've got a particularly hard kind of class suicide to commit, uh, but you must commit it. Uh, in the same way that, that you know, it, it, all of us in, in the professoriate um, at some level have to be un undertaking this idea of subjecting ourselves to accountability in ways that are both locally sensitive to the needs of the communities in which we find ourselves and globally accountable for the fact that here we are in the global north, parasites on the planet uh, and making the global south suffer and helping us to understand that there are movements that can accompany us as we hold ourselves to account and commit that kind of class suicide. But we do need to do it and we do need to commit to it. I actually think that's a really good place to end. Um, and I appreciate everybody's patience as we go over, but can we all just congratulate our speakers and thank them enormously? Um, totally, totally engaging conversation. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just gonna say a few words in the two minutes we have left about what, what the, um, Participants are going to be doing in the future, you, you speakers don't have to stick around for this two minute thing, but um, just uh, to say, I think what you all know, next Saturday we'll be reviewing your completed assignments in the form of a salon. The assignments will go out tomorrow. Um, it'll be quite detailed. I, I think we gave a preview that you're gonna be doing power mapping and that there'll be a power map um, uh, uh, video that, that demonstrates what, what that process is. Um, for the salons, we have six saloners, um, one for each of the home groups and then also a floater. Um, and just to say the saloners for topic one, capitalism, next Saturday are Daniel Barber, Kirsten Day, Sharon Haar, Emmanuel Schwartzberg, and then Priyanka and myself. Um, those bios should be in the chat. Um, and has been discussed. The six of us are also offering midweek office hours for any of you who want to discuss this assignment or the relationship of the assignment to the speaker's talks or probably <laughs> questions about the, the talks and the readings. Um, they're, they're open office hours. Uh, there will be two time options on Wednesday. One is 4 p.m. Eastern time and another at 9 p.m. Eastern time, not all six of us will be at each. There'll be three at four and three of us at, at nine. Um, the assignments, the completed assignments will be posted on Miro um, to which you have the link in the syllabus. If you are unfamiliar with uh, Miro, you can certainly ask those questions or, or take a video tour on your own, um, but you can ask those questions at the office hours. Um, but uh, in one, one way or the other, some facility with Miro and your placing of the assignments will be necessary for the salon on the Saturday week from today. Um, I think we all know this is a lot to take in quickly, um, but this will be repeated when the assignment goes out tomorrow. Um, we're now leaving the Zoom open for people to message, discuss, set up, rejoin assignment groups or home groups again. Um, we're gonna keep it open until 6.30, but um, but certainly don't feel obliged to do that. I suspect we've, we've all had a lot, but thank you all very, very much.